Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to discuss the human metabolic pathways, or lack thereof, for two artificial sweeteners, which are erythritol and sorbitol. Now, you would find these two molecules added as artificial sweeteners to sugar-free products, let's say, that still need to be sweet. Okay, um, so for example, if you were to get a sugar-free Jolly Rancher, um, sugar-free Jolly Ranchers actually contain sorbitol. And some other, uh, usually things you buy in the drugstore um, or health food stores would also contain erythritol. Okay, um, and you can also buy these artificial sweeteners in granular form and you can add them uh, when you're baking a cake or if you want to sweeten your coffee and not add sugar, you can add them to that as well. Okay, um, now the structures, chemical structures that is, of erythritol and sorbitol are shown right here boxed in purple. And what you can kind of guess right now based on this is erythritol actually does not have a metabolic pathway in humans. And that's the first thing we're going to talk about. And then we'll get into the implications in health and disease as you could probably guess over here. So erythritol, as I mentioned, is not metabolized in humans. Okay. Um, in fact, erythritol has never been shown to be metabolized by the microflora, in other words, the microbiome that exists in your gastrointestinal tract. So erythritol is really just, from our purposes, it's just an inert, completely inert, non-labile uh, artificial sweetener. So it's not metabolized at all. So that being said, when you consume erythritol, it tastes sweet because of its ability to bind to sweet taste receptors in the tongue. Uh, but it just basically goes through your GI tract and eventually ends up in the colon. And just so you know here, um, I've abbreviated erythritol as ER and sorbitol as SBL. That's not a standard abbreviation, but it'll work for this purpose. So inside here, this is the lumen of your colon, all right? And so erythritol from this purpose is viewed as a solute. It's going to be inside the colon in a large amount because none of it is metabolized. And so what happens is the solute concentration inside the lumen of the colon increases. All right, so hopefully you know from basic physics or even physiology that if I have a large solute concentration inside the lumen of a tube, um, it's the same kind of thing if it was in the cytoplasm of a cell, then that's going to increase what we call the osmolarity inside that lumen, okay? Because we've got all sorts of solutes in here. Eventually we'll see sorbitol, but right now we've got a lot of erythritol here inside the colon. That increases the osmolarity inside the colon. And so the compensatory uh, reaction is for water to osmos into the lumen of the colon, Okay, and so when you have a lot of erythritol in the colon, you have a lot of water osmosing into the lumen of the colon. And so when you get more water in the colon, that's ultimately what produces the diarrhea that you get, or at least loose stool, when you consume a lot of erythritol. In fact, um, don't do this experiment. I've done it once before inadvertently. If you actually consume just a lot of granular erythritol, um, one time I added way too much to my coffee, then I got a ton of osmolarity inside my colon, and you can guess what happened, okay? Not to be crude there, but that's the mechanism of why erythritol and some of these artificial sweeteners produce diarrhea. They're really not metabolized to any significant extent. Erythritol is not metabolized at all, and so it increases osmolarity in the colon, and so water rushes in to balance the osmolarity between the lumen and the tissues outside, and so the water in the lumen is what gives you the diarrhea. Erythritol is not metabolized, but sorbitol, on the other hand, is metabolized to fructose, and sorbitol can be produced from glucose. Both of these reactions occur in humans. And this short two-step pathway is what we call the polyol pathway. Polyol because these molecules have a lot of alcohols, so they're called polyols. Now, some tissues, such as the seminal vesicles, as we'll see on the next slide, need to manufacture fructose. And notice this is fructose without a phosphate. If we were looking simply at glycolysis or the pentose phosphate pathway, what we would see is like fructose 6-phosphate or in glycolysis fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructose is needed in some amounts uh, in its non-phosphorylated form, just general fructose like this. And you can't make that through glycolysis. So you have to have this polyol pathway to make just regular fructose. And so the pathway is glucose comes into a cell and an enzyme called aldose reductase uses an NADPH to reduce this aldehyde at the top into an alcohol. And when you do this reduction, you get this molecule, which is called sorbitol. Now we'll come back to this in a minute, but sorbitol can actually be taken as an artificial sweetener directly, okay, through the diet. 
Now, any sorbitol that you have, some of it would be from a, a supplement, like from the diet, and some of it would be produced from this glucose. But in any case, some of that sorbitol in some tissues is going to be oxidized by sorbitol dehydrogenase. It's going to use the NAD to abstract the hydrogen right here um, off of carbon number two of sorbitol, and that's going to give you a ketone right here, and that's characteristic of fructose. Okay, So that's how we can generate fructose from sorbitol. Now, as I mentioned, sorbitol can be produced naturally from glucose by the reaction of aldose reductase, and then in some tissues dehydrogenated. But you can also get sorbitol from the diet as from an artificial sweetener that we've talked about. And if you have excess sorbitol, not all of it's going to be able to be metabolized um, by certain cells, such as the seminal vesicles. Instead, that excess sorbitol is going to end up in the lumen of the colon in the same way that erythritol did a minute ago. And so you have all this sorbitol in the colon that's excess. That's going to increase the osmolarity of the colon. And so to balance the osmolarity between the lumen and the tissues outside, water has to osmos in. And of course, that's going to balance the osmolarities. But in the process, you're going to have a lot of water in the colon and then that's gonna produce the diarrhea that you see when you have too much artificial sweetener. And a lot of the artificial sweeteners are gonna do this. If you have way too much of them, they're gonna cause both flatulence and diarrhea. Now we're done with erythritol, but for sorbitol, again, we have one application of this, and that's in the seminal vesicles, as I mentioned. So glucose really has one of two fates. Um, it can either go into glycolysis or the pentose phosphate pathway, or it can go down here into the polyol pathway, which I have again right here. So as we mentioned, glucose can be reduced by aldose reductase into sorbitol, and then sorbitol dehydrogenase oxidizes the second carbon of sorbitol into a ketone, and that gives us this molecule, fructose. And the reason why the seminal vesicles would be uh, needing to generate lots of fructose is sperm cells, or sp spermatozoans, those kind of cells actually metabolize exclusively fructose. Um, they don't actually metabolize glucose. Um, and so during an ejaculation, when a man releases sperm cells or spermatozoans, he also releases amounts of fructose. And so the sperm cells are going to be able to import that fructose. And inside the sperm cell, they're going to metabolize that fructose. And I won't go into too much detail on this pathway, but it suffices to say that the fructose will be phosphorylated into fructose 1-phosphate, and then through a series of reactions, you'll actually generate glycolytic intermediates, such as dihydroxyacetone phosphate, DHAP, and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, G3P, both of which will go through glycolysis to generate pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, and so on and so forth. And all that energy is going to be used mainly by the spermatozoan in order to propel this flagella so that it can swim towards the egg for fertilization. Okay, But that's actually um, from the molecule sorbitol initially. So these cells have to take glucose and convert them to fructose, and then they can be um, ejaculated with the sperm cell, and then the sperm cell can metabolize the fructose. Okay. All right, so hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of what happens when you consume erythritol and sorbitol, usually from a dietary supplement or sweetener. And then we also see that sorbitol has some other functions as being an intermediate in the polyol pathway, whereby sperm cells can actually derive metabolic energy. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.